where can I get my car detailed? You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball, part of the locked on podcast network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball. Today's episode, I'm going to be doing a mailbag episode. I solicited questions from you guys earlier in the week. I'm going to be answering a selection of those today. So Michael Bolton, let's get to it, to it. The, uh, the Red Rock Dynasty League rookie drafts all started today. So uh, those, those are kicked off in the last hour or so. I've made one pick at pick number three. I am going to do a full episode talking about the ADP of rookies across those six Dynasty Leagues. But uh, I'll give you the rundown of what's happened so far. In that league, number one went Luka Doncic. Number two went Jaron Jackson Jr. Number three was me. And I picked DeAndre Ayton at pick three. And then Wendell Carter Jr. went at pick four. So that's the first four picks off the board in that uh, in that league, which is the longest running of the Red Rock Dynasty Leagues. I believe we're heading into our fourth season now. Uh, so I uh, get, uh, get uh, DeAndre Ayton with pick three. You may agree or disagree with that, but that's the direction that I went with that selection. So let's talk um, Let's talk about uh, mailbag questions and questions that you guys have to ask. I had an interesting day yesterday. I went through and planned out the schedule for podcasts all the way up until the beginning of the season. So the next two and a bit months of podcasts are pretty much planned out with obviously a little bit of uh, flexibility in there. We're going to be doing some, uh, some auction stuff, some uh, points leagues specific podcast, a whole bunch of mock drafts as well, talking about projections, a whole a whole range of things. And I think that you will enjoy those. Plus, we'll, I will be debuting the Dynasty only uh, sub portion of the uh, of the feed. It will still be on the same feed. There'll just be a, a separate podcast once a week specifically for Dynasty uh, in addition to the regular uh, five podcasts you get per week. Let's talk Let's talk about mailbags. Let's answer your questions that you guys did ask me. The first one comes from Ryan Jones. He says, hey man, would you mind ranking these guys for Dynasty Startup? I know your projections aren't up yet. Just a ballpark idea if that's what you can do. The four players he names are Drew Holiday, Andre Drummond, Kristaps Porzingis, Porzingis, and Kyrie Irving. And these guys are all in a similar sort of range in that um, yeah, second to third round uh, range. I would put, if we're talking about dynasty value, I would put Porzingis number one. Now, yes, he's going to miss the first three, four months of this season, perhaps. But we're talking dynasty in a lot of cases. Now, I do like to look at a win-now mode in dynasty leagues. I have said that plenty of times because so many people go super, super young with unproven players. And they take... Those guys, like you might, you'll probably see in dynasty leagues, and we'll see that when the new dynasty leagues start up in the next four or five days, that guys like Doncic will go at twenty, and uh, and uh, you know, Jaron Jackson will go at thirty, and Aiton will go at thirty, and we have no idea where they'll ever get to that level. A guy like Porzingis, we know what he can be. We know he's a top twenty-five player already, and he can get better from there. That efficiency can go up. The rebounding numbers can go up. He can be a top fifteen player. We know this already. And yes, we're missing half a season, but I still know that I'm getting a top twenty guy at least for the next four or five seasons, probably. Kyrie Irving's had the, been the guy there in that group with the highest peak. I worry that he is a little bit older. I worry that the, the knee could be an issue moving forward that might limit some of his explosiveness, but I have him second in that list. And then you've got Drew Holiday and Andre Drummond. I know Andre Drummond has that tremendous value in punt free throw builds. I don't know what sort of build you're looking at here, Ryan, with that thing. So I, I put Drew slightly ahead of Drummond, but they're basically 3A and 3B in terms of that list. So Porzingis, Irving, Holiday, Drummond is the way that I would uh, look at um, look at that ranking list that you provided me. The next question comes from Ben McQueen. He says, the best way to go about drafts for large leagues like 30 team leagues, how do you manage the slow drafts across different time zones? Do you utilize the sleep tool on Fantrax? And for those of you that don't know what the sleep tool is, on Fantrax, unlike the other fantasy providers, you can do drafts where the, the timer between picks is not 30 seconds or 45 seconds or 1 minute 30, I think, which is the most you can do on Yahoo and, and ESPN. Maybe two minutes you can go to. On Fantrax, you can do them at 24 hours. 
You can do 10 hours, 12 hours, eight hours, six hours. So that's how I handle all of the listener leagues, all of the dynasty leagues, because there are people in different areas. There are people that live in New York. There are people that live in Los Angeles. There are people that live in Australia, in Melbourne, in Perth, in Europe, in Croatia, in Sweden, in, uh, in Thailand, in Vietnam, in all over the globe. So it, getting guys together, especially in deep leagues, with 30 blokes to go, or oh, come here for this one time, it, it can be pretty tough to do. The sleep tool, what that does, is that you can turn off the the drafting clock during a certain amount of time. I don't use it because to me, it defeats the purpose of having the long window for picks for different time zones. And this is a problem that, that I had when I was doing the 30 deep draft, which you may have seen um, is, a, is a draft among fantasy writers, there's 30 teams in it. And they set up this, uh, this sleep tool. The problem is, is that the sleep tool was set up, but for me, that was when I was available to draft. They had the sleep tool when they were asleep, but that was like you know, 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. my time. So if my pick fell in that time, I couldn't actually make my pick because this sleep tool was on. So I don't utilize that, but I do put that you know, six to eight hours per pick. Yeah, you, you might hey, you might sleep for 10 hours a night, so there's the theoretical chance that your pick could come up and be gone while you're sleeping. But if you go on a bed and you go, you know what, there's five picks until my guy, until my pick, let's put five guys in a queue and go to sleep on the off chance that everything rushes through in that next five minutes before I sleep and then I'm on the clock for the full eight hours while I'm sleeping. I've still got an option there of these different picks. But in general, if you just set up an eight hour pick, you can do six if you want, you can do 10, whatever. But if you set that up at eight hours, don't use the sleep tool because it actually will end up stalling the draft you'll see that that'll come up and there'll be guys who are sitting in these other times and it's going, well, we want to pick, but the, the draft has been put to sleep during this time. Um, and that's obviously a, uh, a little bit frustrating in, in that sort of a regard. So you, you can use it by all means, um, but yeah, that's the way I like to look at it. Let's let the clock keep running on those. So that's, uh, that is the best way to set those up, in my opinion. The next question comes from... Uh, uh, I never know how to pronounce this. Uh, Nora Mes... You you know who you are. In in incognito is uh, the Twitter name there for for you. I never know how to pronounce no 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 Remax Nilock. I know that was the really fantastic radio for me to just pronounce that again. How do you strategize for a keeper league that imposes a real life salary cap to each of its players all season long? You know that I run plenty of these leagues as well. How do you approach the draft knowing that stars cost more and trying to fill out a complete fifteen man roster IR also goes against your cap? Getting guys on cheap contracts early is massive. Nikola Jokic was probably a top three pick in these real salary type startup leagues for the last two seasons. A guy making one million million dollars as a top ten player. Yeah, you know what? Anthony Davis might provide more per game value. James Harden might provide per more per game value. But do they provide twenty five times more more per game value? The answer to that is clearly no. Now we look at it now. And Jokic is not that guy anymore because his salary has risen. So who's the new king of that group? Those young players who provide that value. Ben Simmons can be a top 20 player, but he's the number one pick. So his rookie scale contract's a bit higher. The guy you look at there is the Don, Donovan Mitchell, who comes in at the salary for the 13th pick, a much lower number than, say, number one at Ben Simmons or number three at, uh, at Jason Tatum or number two even at Lonzo Ball, who we're talking six, seven million dollars for those guys, whereas Mitchell is significantly lower in the salary mark. So you get him in the first round and he's got that top 10 upside at some point in the future, but it just gives you so much flexibility when everyone else in that first round is going to be taking 20, 30 million dollar guys. KD's at 30, Curry's at 35, Harden's at 35, uh, Davis is at 26. Yeah, Towns is the other one there that you want to look at, obviously, but he's only got one more year on that cheap deal. So he's, I think, at seven million this season as a number one pick as well. And that's going to bump to 26 or 27, whatever the uh, max salary is for next season. Giannis is already into his uh, um, extended contract. He's at 25 plus million dollars. So all these guys outside of Towns, who probably goes one in, in this situation, just because you get that one year of cheap value and you can really push to win now by get, utilizing, it's like real NBA teams using teams, players with low low cap holds to delay their signing to get other guys in and then going over the cap with that guy. Getting a guy like Towns for this one year opens up yeah, it might open up 15, 16, 17 million extra dollars for you to go in that win now mode. And the same with the, the Don, Donovan Mitchell, but at least you've got three more seasons of Mitchell at that amount. 
You could make arguments for other guys. You know, Wendell Carter Jr. is the seventh pick. He's going to come in at a cheap price. So getting those cheap bargain type value players is uh, is a really key part of setting up the initial part of those seasons. Now it's always going to run out. These rookies who have never played have got um, have got four seasons. The guys who have played one year have got three seasons left on these cheaper contracts. It's about trying to find the right value on on, uh, on these players. A guy like Kemba Walker, he's great value, twelve million dollars, but it's only going to be for one more season. Jarrett Allen, a really, really cheap option that is probably got a chance to be a top 50 guy. Same with the Baptist, John Collins. You've got three more years of these guys being $2 million players. Tons of value on them. Jamal Murray, the Blue Arrow, while he, he doesn't have as long on his deal as these guys, another guy, really cheap value that bumps up. Lowry Markin and the artist formerly known as Torian Prince. These sort of players have that tremendous level of value due to the fact that they are still on rookie scale contracts. So they are important guys to pay attention to. Someone like Jordan Bell, like he, he's like a million dollars this season, but he becomes a restricted free agent after this season. So his value is most likely going to leap up. So you're looking at these cheaper options and get them early. And then there are going to be players that slide. And you might say you don't feel great about spending $33 million on Paul Millsap, but when it gets down to pick 100 and he's still there because people can't afford it, but you can fit it in, Millsap who could, or maybe it's a pick 150, people couldn't fit it in. You can get Millsap a pick 150 when other people are going through and picking Garrett Temple at that spot. And that's a huge value difference because you've got that cap around, you've got those other value guys in, and then you get top 50, top 60 potential guys who slide outside the top 150, potentially outside the top 200 because people cannot fit them into their salary cap. So that to me, is a really key uh, portion of, of, of the strategy in those real salary cap leagues. Rookie scale contracts, even a guy like Carmelo Anthony, you might think he had a shit year, but he's coming in at veteran minimum salary. So you can get him for $2 million and put him on your roster. And even if he's not a top 100 player, it doesn't matter. Like that is really, really high value for a guy like him. So have a look at those cheap sort of deals. And of course, Boogie Cousins for this one season uh, has good value, but that's going to change. Uh, when he uh, he's not going to play half this season, and then he's going to come back for next year and most likely be on a higher deal. The next question comes from, I cannot pronounce that uh, Twitter name apart from the 76ers at the end. It's in Russian, so thank you, Ben. Your, uh, your Twitter handle is at Scouse underscore Raw. He says, who are guys who have taken a big hit through situation coaching or organizational change in this past season, uh, past season performance or a combo thereof as far as dynasty value goes this off season? An obvious example you posted about earlier would be Michael Kidd Gilchrist, but other guys like that. Now, Ben, I'm not going to fully answer this question now because tomorrow... Uh, I am doing a, a full, actually tomorrow's podcast, Friday's podcast and Monday's podcast, which sorry, tomorrow and Friday are the same thing. Um, I'm going to be doing, looking at the Eastern Conference and the Western Conference for players who find themselves in worse situations this year as opposed to last season. So I don't want to spoil too much there. But a guy like uh, Punch Bob Shiploke in Chicago, who was getting nearly all of the backup minutes at center last season. Wendell Carter and Robin Lopez are both there now. Larry Markinen at power forward. Jabari Parker, who will start at the three, but surely they play him some at the four. I think that does mean that Portis is going to see fewer touches and fewer minutes this season. Similarly in Indiana, uh, DeMontis Sabonis, who played a lot of minutes with Miles Turner's injury last season, but now we look at him and they brought in Kylo Quinn to play a lot of those backup center minutes. So does that mean that Sabonis is going to be forced more to the four, which is not the ideal spot for him? Plus Thad Young is there, plus Doug McDermott and Boyan Bogdanovich can also push up to the four, especially with the addition of Tyreek Evans in a Collison, Oladipo, Evans, one, two, three combination. So I think that while it's not going to necessarily render Sabonis ineffective, the ability for him to do what he did last year in terms of minutes or even push further forward is really limited by the presence of O'Quinn and some of those other signings. And of course, Kid Gilchrist, I believe that he's got a chance to move to the bench and see his minutes drop pretty significantly this season with uh, Malik Monk or Jeremy Lamb moving into the starting lineup and even the acquisition of Miles Bridges through the draft could really impact someone like Michael Kid Gilchrist for this coming season. Thanks for the question, Ben. Dennis Hickson the third at Dennis underscore third says, what is your favorite underrated punt build coming into this season, not including free throws and turnovers? Well, you're already taking two options off the board there for me, Dennis. I haven't gone through and done all of the projections for this season. So you're seeing a, a build that definitely that stands out isn't quite there. But the two ones that always remain underrated is points. Punting points is basically 
is basically the uh, the the option is basically the most underrated um, build out there if people find it hard to disengage points from overall fantasy value. So there can be a ton of value in that one. The other one that I tend to like is assists. Getting rid of those uh, those point guards there can also help your field goal percentage. Um, in addition there, it, it uh, undoubtedly makes you strong in turnovers if you're looking at that. So points number one and assists number two, they're two categories that people don't often go for uh, when looking at punt builds. Therefore, a lot of value can be baked into that. I believe Dennis has another question here. He says, what are some strategies in Dynasty League that aren't just going for it this year and tanking going for picks and young guys? Um well, they are. Look, realistically, when you're looking at dynasty leagues, you've got to sort of have a, an NBA mentality. You're trying to compete or you're trying to get into a position to compete. So you can make yourself the Charlotte Hornets of a dynasty league and compete for the ninth seed or the 10th seed. And you know, what does that give you? You're not getting playoff revenue in, in a dynasty type of league. Now, I try to set up the dynasty league so there's less incentive to tank. And the other thing that I do is I reward cash prizes in a lot of cases, not every dynasty league, but in a lot of them, uh, to every team that makes the playoffs. So pushing into that into that playoff spot, even if it's just the last seed, you get some money back. So it does incentivize that. So that's another way you can go, hey, just continue to get myself in the playoffs, break even. And if things go right, I can push up and maybe win a round, maybe win two rounds and get my money uh, returning at a higher level. So that's it all does depend on that price structure. If the prizes are paying out for winner and runner up only, then your real option is only to try and get these assets, try and get these draft picks. That's why I like to spread the, the prize pool out for a lot of dynasty formats to try and get people pushing for the playoffs so there's less incentive to necessarily uh, bottom out completely. And I put a lot of uh, measures in place for that. But it really does depend on how that prize structure looks in your league. Omar Levin says, where will you pick Cousins in a dynasty initial draft? Now, of course, Boog was a top 10 player last season. He's going to miss a big chunk of this season. The problem we have with him is it's the return from the Achilles injury. Not that he won't be back on the court, because he will. But what level does he get back to? I talked about Porzingis earlier on, how I'd be okay taking him at first out of that group, because I think he's got six, seven, top 15 type seasons ahead of him. With Boogie, I'm not sure that he does. He's obviously considerably older than Porzingis. And if his athleticism doesn't return, if he loses a lot of efficiency, he's he's already struggles defensively. You know, does his shot blocking numbers drop? Does his usage drop? Does that efficiency drop even further coming back from the Achilles? Does that mean he can be a top 10 guy? I would hedge my bets pretty significantly. I'd still feel pretty good about taking him in the top 25. I think he can have at least two to three more top 25 seasons, but he is older. And I think the drop off with someone like that coming off the Achilles, Achilles could be pretty significant. So I'd be looking at him in that 25-ish type of range, I think, in a dynasty league with the knowledge that he's not going to produce that value next season, but you should be able to get maybe two to three more years at that sort of level, hopefully higher, but at least at that sort of level as you move forward. The next question comes from the Waiver Warrior at Warrior Waves. On a, in a dynasty salary league, how much higher should the cap be if you want deeper benches like you talked about? Well, that question is relatively non-specific um, because it really depends on the size of your league. If you've got a 30-team league, that's mirroring the NBA. Use your use your NBA salary cap. If you're using, I assume when you say dynasty salary, you're using the real NBA uh, salary cap. Because if you're using artificial salaries, whether that's via auction or via dollar values per slot in the draft, then it doesn't really matter what you set the cap at because everything else constrains to that. What I would be doing, if you're running a 16-team real salary dynasty league, what I'd be be looking at doing, again, if you're extending the benches out to cover you know, 350, 400, 400 NBA players, which is about what you should be doing in a lot of cases, what you want to do is have a look. Um, I haven't done the maths here for you. You can go and do that. 30 teams, $101 million salary cap. Now, you can look at it and go, nearly every team is over the cap. So maybe you look at it 30 teams times $110 million whatever that comes out to, and then divide it by how many teams you've actually got. You want to, It's almost similar to looking at how you'd look at an auction draft in fantasy. How much cash is actually out there in the NBA on contracts? Do you have a similar amount of players rostered in your league versus what the NBA has rostered? 
If that's the case, then you need to divide that total cash pool up by how many teams you've got. So say you ran a 15 team league, and I'm using this just uh, for ease of numbers. You use, say we're, we're gonna say 110 is the number for a 30 team league, taking into account the, the luxury tax, whatever it is, 110 for 30 teams. For 15 teams, 220. And then that enables you with still those expanded rosters to fit all those players around. Now, if you wanna make it harder and you want more waiver wire churning where some players who make a lot of money, like the aforementioned Paul Millsap, he might end up on the waiver wire because you've only got $120 million in cap with 16 teams. So holding someone at that number means it's impossible to fill out your roster. And I've seen you know, real dynasty, real salary leagues in the past, say 14 teams, where guys like Carmelo Anthony have just been, and Marcus Sol even, have been sitting on the waiver wire because we just cannot afford you know, putting up 30% of our cap for, for a guy when we, we just can't fill out the rest of our roster that way. But that's the way to be looking at it. Check your league size as opposed to players rostered in the NBA um, and teams versus NBA teams, taking that prize pool and dividing it by the amount of teams that you've got there. Um, the next question comes from Rob Fox at Teen Come Sledge 2. It's a questionable username. Rob says, could the hypothetical Kings beat the Warriors? And by hypothetical Kings, I mean the guys the Kings should have drafted instead of the guys that they did draft with their last eight lottery picks. Rob, I'm going to tell you, I spent probably way too much time on this question going through this. You could make arguments for you know, the picks. And I didn't look at it and go, well, the Kings picked at pick five, but this star appeared at pick 25. Because I don't think that's a realistic representation of who they should have picked at that spot. I went maybe two, three, four, five spots after that pick thinking of other guys they could have selected. So let's go back over the last eight drafts of who the Kings picked and who they could have picked in that spot. At pick number five in 2017, they picked De'Aaron Fox. I left it there. You could make the argument for, for John Isaac, for Dennis Smith to go ahead of him. You're taking Donovan Mitchell at that spot is not a realistic proposition, but they did also have the number 10 pick, which they traded to the Portland Trailblazers for 15 and 20, and that's where they could have gone. They could have taken Donovan Mitchell at pick number 10, so they could have come out of 2017 with De'Aaron Fox and Donovan Mitchell. In 2016, they picked Marquise Chris at number eight. A couple of guys, they uh, they could have taken uh, DeMontis Sabonis with that selection. Not really a huge uh, needle mover, but I think he's a better player than what Marquise Chris in is. At 2015, maybe I stretched it a little bit here, Willie Cauley-Stein went, and then they could have taken Devin Booker, who went about five spots later. But So we're looking at a Mitchell Fox, Sabonis, Booker lineup. In 2014, they picked Nick Stauska, Sauce Castillo at pick eight. They could have taken Dario Saric, Zaki Levine, Yusuf Nurkic, or Gaz Harris. Nice, Gary! Again, maybe I'm stretching that out a little bit too much, but there, there's a bunch of guys they could have taken with that selection. Let's go with, uh, let's go with, um, probably don't need Gaz at that point, uh, even though I'm going in reverse order here. Maybe you take Gaz, maybe you take Saric there. In 2013, they took Benny McLemore at pick seven. Contavious Caldwell Pope or CJ McCollum would have been your options there. You'd probably take CJ there. In 2012, the obvious one is Thomas Robinson when at pick number five. One pick later was Damian Lillard. You'd take Lillard there. In 2011, they selected Bismack Biombo and then they traded that pick so they could get Jimmer Fredette. Uh, about a pick later, Kemba Walker went at number nine. You'd take Kemba. And then in 2010, they took DeMarcus Cousins at pick five. And of course, you keep DeMarcus Cousins. So we're looking at a Lillard, Kemba, Boogie, CJ, Sharich lineup with with Devin Booker, Donovan Mitchell, uh, DeMontis Sabonis, De'Aaron Fox. It's a pretty strong, pretty strong nine-man lineup there. Would it beat the Warriors? Um... I don't think so. I think their defense would uh, would struggle a little bit there. There's a lot of uh, one-way guys, Sharich, CJ, Lillard, Kemba. They're, yeah, some of those guys have improved, obviously. Lillard and CJ and Kemba have improved their defense, but they're not great. They, they would get really, really you know, get in a lot of trouble. They, they can score, but yeah, Mitchell, Booker, CJ, Lillard, Kemba, Boogie, like there's only one ball to go around. And you, you hear that phrase bandied around a lot between three guys, but not around seven or eight guys. So while their team would be strong and they might be able to move some of these other guys for other players. Um, yeah, I think that even Steven Adams was in the mix there in one of those picks. They could have gone with someone like him, but how does that fit alongside DeMarcus Cousins? I don't think they would beat the Warriors because we're talking about MVP players. Steph Curry with two. 
Defensive Player of the Year. Uh, sorry, KD with one Defensive Player of the Year in Draymond Green, one of the best shooters of all time in Clay Thompson. And while these are all very good players and and all stars in this group, I just don't think that they beat the Warriors just with that collection of talent alone. But uh, it's an interesting question, Rob. And uh, I do thank you for wasting, well, not wasting, for me dedicating so much time to try and go through and work out how that would all go down. Dan Nguyen, who's on Twitter at Nguyen T. Dan, says, with the health risk and the new team, where do you think Kawhi Leonard should go and the latest he should go? Is he worth the risk? Well, of course, we know that he has passed his physical. That doesn't mean that he is necessarily back at the same level he was in 16-17 or 15-16. It just means that the trade is official. We don't have any idea how this degenerative quad tendon issue is going to go for this coming season. Where do I think he, he should go? Haven't done the Spurs projections and haven't done the rest of the league's projections to find out where he sort of fits. But I think that if he is fully healthy, he is likely to play more minutes in Toronto than San Antonio. Uh, but you do have to factor that risk in with Kawhi. And I think taking him at the turn, 11, 12, 13, 14, that sort of range is fine. There is absolute top five upside there for Kawhi. If you wanted to take him at 10 or 9, I could totally understand that. Um, LeBron, Jokic, were probably two guys I'd have ahead of Kawhi, just with more certainty with what they're going to do. But after that, I think it's it's all well and good. You know, you've got those other guys in the mix there: Paul George, Jim Butler, Kyrie Irving, uh, Kevin Love. Does he jump into that mix and in that discussion there? Lillard in that zone as well. Oladipo. Where does Kawhi fit there? Well, Kawhi's got that top five upside. I'm not sure that those other guys necessarily have that level to go to that area. The risk is, is clearly there. Um, and you don't want to take a second risky guy with your first or second pick, depending on when you grab Kawhi. But again, I'll have more information on this when I do in the projections and see where it comes out. And of course, when more news comes out about Leonard and where he's sitting and how he's tracking and how he looks in preseason and all that sort of stuff. But at this point, I think end of the first round, start of the second, it's probably the right spot for Kawhi Leonard. Unbreakable on Twitter at King Unbreakable says Devin Booker finished with a rank of approximately 25 last season without turnover, so eight cat rank. Could you see him pushing towards the top 20 this season? His assist numbers and efficiency will surely go up with DeAndre Ayton and Trevor Ariza in the starting five instead of Len slash Chandler and Chris slash Bender. I agree with both of those things that the assist numbers should surely go up, and the efficient num- fish the efficiency numbers will go up, but. Will the usage maintain at the level it was at? And will the scoring dip? And I think that all those things are a possibility. I think we'll see a lot more Booker at point guard lineups alongside the wings, Jackson, Bridges, Warren, and Ariza with Aiden there at center. So he could easily be averaging six and a half assists. And if he came out of the season with a seven and a half assist season, I wouldn't be stunned. It's a low percentile outcome possibility, but I think it can happen. But he averaged 25 points per game last season. I think that probably might come down to 23 as he loses a little, a few touches there to Aiton. Uh, Josh Jackson is a notorious chucker, so he's going to get shots. Ariza, I'm not worried about there. But I think that, that Booker can definitely push towards top 20. You get a 3-4 percentage point increase in true shooting, which is a possibility, with a two-assist uh, rise. And if he can get those steals, at least to, if you get him to 1.1 or 1.2, which is an ask because he hasn't done it yet, but if he does it, there's is easy top 20 value. So yes, I do believe that that's a significant possibility for this upcoming season. The next question we look at comes from Full Court Report on Twitter, at report underscore court. I know it all depends on team build and what you're punting, but in a vacuum, in a nine-cat head-to-head league, who do you think will provide more value this season between Kevin Love and DeMar DeRozan? It's Kevin Love. I am, I'm really, really confident in Kevin Love. He has come out, real, I've done the Cavs projection so far, he's come out very, very well. In the, uh, in the initial pass through on those. Um, I don't see massive amounts changing for DeMar DeRozan. And in, in effect, it's the opposite of Kawhi Leonard where DeRozan was playing 34, 35, 36 minutes in Toronto. Does he come back and play 33 here in San Antonio? We know that he always adds things to his game. He got his passing going, but will, you know, will he be able to develop those threes? You know, playing for Popovich is obviously an upgrade over Dwayne Casey, but what extra area does DeRozan improve? Does he get to 1.7 steals? No chance. Does he start hitting 1.5 threes? I'd be really doubtful, especially considering the Spurs don't seem to give two shits about shooting threes. Will he come in and be able to score the same amount of points? Well, LaMarcus Aldridge is a higher usage player than what Kyle Lowry is, so he might even struggle in that regard. So I don't see, I see Love taking a significant leap forward. And while everyone's, well, a lot of people seem to be thinking DeMar's going to be taking this massive step forward, I don't necessarily see it. I think he might be very similar, um, but and, and even even a step back. But again, haven't done the uh, the Spurs projections yet, but I wouldn't be surprised at that. I would take Love 
the injury risk is a real problem with Kevin Love, but I think that he is not going to be Minnesota Kevin Love. Don't get your hopes up. Not a top 10 guy, but definitely a top 20 type of player with a potential, uh, yeah, maybe it's top 25, but I think he's got that second round type value for this coming season. It could be a real big one for Big Kev. At Eli, with a E in brackets, at Haitian underscore Mamba. Who, what are your top five teams for fantasy values taking into account pace and non-tanking factors? It's a good question. Haven't gone through and again, haven't gone through and done all of the teams yet, but five teams that I went through here that's going to have a, a lot of fantasy value. Denver, of course, the, one of the best offenses in the NBA. All five starters have the real chance to be top 100 players. The Blue Arrow, Gaz Harris, Farton, Will Barton, Paulie Millsap, and Nikola, Nikola? Nikola Jokic. Pretty good. Pretty, 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 pretty good. There's value in those. Throw in Isaiah Thomas, who could have a sneaky top 110, top 100 season as well. That great offense is great, great value on that Denver team. Boston is another one. Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Kyrie Irving, Marcus Smart, um, Al Horford, Gordon Haywood. All those guys have a chance to be top 100-ish type guys. Smart maybe not there, and Jalen Brown, two guys who weren't in the top 100 last season, but they could move into that zone as well. Ball movement on offense. Everyone's game seems to elevate in Boston. Strong defense. Really, really like them as a, as a, a fantasy team. The Toronto Raptors are a team that tends to put up value. And I'm looking at guys, again, with really stable type rotations. Valanchunas doesn't need many minutes to put up numbers. Lowry, uh, Kawhi Leonard, I think OG Ananobi is interesting. Freddie Van Vliet has his moments. Serge Ibaka will be up and down, a little bit off on him, but there's something there. Danny Green, could he see a resurgence? Does Nick Nurse lean more heavily on the starters uh, than, than uh, some of those other guys like Green and Kawhi suffered in San Antonio? So I think they're an interesting one. Philly's always a great one. Joel Embiid, Ben Simmons, JJ Riddick, the rise of potentially of Markel Fultz, Bob Cub, Dario Saric. There's you know, five top 100 type players there. Maybe we're looking at six with Fultz. Some real value on that team. A solid rotation, stable, you know, pretty strong pace, and lots of stats to go around. And the Milwaukee Bucks are another team that I like. Now, of course, I could say Golden State and Houston and all those guys. But Milwaukee, Bledsoe, Middleton, Brogdon, Giannis, Brook Lopez in that mix as well. All guys who can put up pretty good value. I think Budenholz will run a fairly stable rotation with this team on a contending team that is pushing and looking to push into that top four spot to take that fourth spot in the top four that the Cavs will likely vacate. And I think there's a lot of stability there. There's a lot of numbers that can be acquired by lots of players in Milwaukee. But it is a good question, so thank you for asking it. JJ on Twitter at Jero1D says, what's your outlook on Dennis Smith Jr. with Luka Doncic in the picture in Dynasty? What's his ceiling and floor? His ceiling to me is still pretty clearly top uh, top 40. Uh, I think he's, he's floor. I think he's top 100. I'm not really worried about Doncic playing next to him. They will play alongside each other pretty comfortably. Doncic knows how to play alongside a point guard. Dennis Smith's shooting percentages come up considerably when he's uh, shooting off the, off the catch rather than off the dribble. So that should help his efficiency. He'll still get his assists. He still has his explosion. He still generates steals. He'll still score. I don't really. I think Doncic actually helps Smith. It takes some of the level of uh, responsibility off him, gets his efficiency up as well. And those two guys, and we know that Rick Carlisle is the master of running multiple ball handlers together, and that is going to be perfect for both these guys. So Doncic doesn't bother me at all for Dennis Smith Jr. in terms of his future outlook. Hammer at Eastgate Cruise said, "What round should Porzingis be targeted in?" Porzingis. I guess we're talking redraft here. And as I said on yesterday's Injury Watch show, I think you're looking at around the 90s. So depending, and I don't really like talking about rounds in fantasy in general because, and I say it often for first round, second round, because that's pretty pretty much the same. But if you're talking 12 team, 10 team, 14, 16, 18, 20 team league, round eight is very, very different in, in a 10 team league as opposed to a 16 team league. So I like to give pick ranges. So I think, Around 90-ish in a 10 or 12 team league is about the right spot, maybe 100 for Porzingis. But in a 20 team league, that's like your fifth best player. So I don't think you want to be taking him there at that level. You want to, you're going to be then without a starter for so long in the season. And your waiver wire guy in a 20 team league is not the 150th best player. 
it's probably the 270th best player, and that is a big, big drop-off to try and deal with. So it does depend in your on your league. You want him to probably be a, a guy that's the third or fourth worst guy or fourth last pick in your draft. So that the difference between that pick and the waiver wire guy for the first three or four months is not as stark. And again, if you miss out on him, big deal. He unlo- He's unlikely to be a top 20 guy when he does come back, limited minutes, some games off when he does return, and are you actually in a position to compete after not having him there for three and a half months? So around that zone, nine, nineties, hundreds, that sort of mark, I think, for Kristaps Porzingis. Next question comes from B Dub, who's on Twitter at the only real B Dub. I reckon there might be a couple of other B Dubs out there, so that's a it's, it's an interesting Twitter handle. The potential mailbag question, he says, thinking as if you were personally the GM of Atlanta, how would you value the Baptist John Collins in terms of 2018 draft picks? Would you have taken taken number two for him, number five, number seven? The same question, thinking as an owner in a 30-team dynasty league. It's an interesting question. So if I owned John Collins as either, or don't own him, if I had him as uh, as the Atlanta Hawks GM or on my fantasy team, would I have taken pick number two for him? Yes. No doubt about that. Would I would I have taken pick number five for him? Probably. After that, it gets dicey. Aiton, Doncic, Jackson, Carter, and then a combination of Young, Bumba, Bug, Bagley are your top seven guys. Um, I you know, a guy like Bagley is an interesting one for me. I'm not massively high on him, and I think there's a legitimate chance that uh, Johnny Collins has a better NBA career than Marvin Bagley. So around that seven mark, potentially pick six is probably the level that I'd put Collins. He obviously went way too late in the 2017 draft at pick number 19. I think probably pick 70 is about the right spot for what Collins can produce those guys who went after that area, the Bridges boys, uh, Gilgis Alexander. Maybe, maybe you can make an argument you want Shea over John Collins um, just because guard and wing play is so much more um, beneficial. Same with the Bridges boys. Um, but I think around that seven that seven mark is probably the right spot for John Collins. But I'd like to hear everyone else's opinion on that. Do you think I'm being too bullish on Collins? Am I underrating some of those other guys like Sexton, like the Fort, like the Bridges, like Gilgis Alexander? I'm just really big on the Baptist John Collins. The next question comes from the Triant, who's on Twitter at the Triant. What extra categories would you include in a league if you wanted to make it more than nine cat? First of all, I wouldn't want to make it more than nine cat. I just think that becomes unnecessary. What I would do is I want hustle stats added. Now you can either have them as one overall hustle number or as the other things, deflections, screen assists, contested shots. I would love those to be added in. That's my my not dream, but that's what I want fantasy to add in is those stats in those hustle stats. Otherwise, what I would do is I would convert rebounds to defensive rebounds and offensive rebounds. That's one extra category there. I would convert field goal percentage to two points and three point percentage. That's one extra category there. And you're already at 11 categories now. The other you know, things will people will look at is, oh, do you put in team? Uh, do you put in fouls? Hate them. Do you put in techs? Hate them. Ejections? Hate them. Free throws made? Yuck. Field goals made? Yuck. Not a fan of those stats or those categories at all. So I wouldn't be looking at them in that way. If you wanted to add uh, another um, another negative category, maybe shots blocked. So how many times your own player gets his shot blocked? That's an interesting one to add in there. There are, you know, Fantrax offers a whole bunch of different categories. I probably should uh, bring up some of the uh, interesting categories they have on there. Um, and they've got stuff like, you know, points uh, points at the rim and things like that. I'm going to bring that list of, of their categories up so I can give you some of the ideas. But a lot of them are, and there are options there. True shooting percentage is one, but I think if you have twos, threes, and free throw percentage, it's an interest, it's, it's enough there. You could have assist to turnover ratio, but again, if you've got assist and turnovers, I don't think having both of those are necessarily the way to go. Double doubles, I don't like it. It's a real self-limiting stat. You just can't find that sort of stat off the waiver wire. They're just a bunch of guys that do it, and because you need to get to that 10 rebound or 10 assist threshold, the other guys just don't do it. So you can't stream a guy in and you get six rebounds and it gives you 0.6 of a double-double. It doesn't work that way. So I don't like double doubles or triple doubles. 
Um, just looking at some other things they have here. Ejections, as I said, I don't really like. They do have a whole bunch of stuff, like field goals made in the mid-range, field goals made at the rim, field goals mid-range percentage, field goals at the rim percentage. You can go wild with those sort of things. So take out two-point percentage, go mid-range percentage, three-point percentage at the rim percentage. There's some definite different things that you can put there. They have a weird category called game-winning buzzer beaters. I don't think that's going to happen all that often. Games played, you could do games started, team win, team losses, minutes per game is another option. Again, don't really like fouls uh, as, a, as a, an option you can do there. Um, true shooting, as I mentioned already, tech fouls, I'm, I'm not into, triple doubles, um, what else have they got here? Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other, you know, plus minus is an interesting stat that you could put in there that could really throw a few things off uh, off, uh, off the list. But there's a, I reckon there's probably 40 different categories that you can add over on uh, on uh, Fantrix. They also offer the per game stats. So instead of having you know, your weekly matchup where you add all the points together, you can do it as a points per game. So what does your team average per game? And in that sort of situation, you have to set limits of how many games you have to play minimum because otherwise people could just start, oh, I'm going to start two Kevin Durant games and that's it and look how good my averages are. But you can do that on an average basis and that takes out a lot of the randomness of injuries and rests and games sat and all that sort of stuff. So that's another way that you can do it. But I wouldn't really recommend going above nine categories. Hustle stats, I want them in. Let's get them in. If you work for ESPN or Yahoo or Fantrax, get them in as stats. Otherwise, let's go offensive, defensive rebounds. That gives you the 10 categories. Let's go two and three point percentage. That gets you to 11 categories. And there's your extra couple of categories. The last question for today's show comes from Scott Abelick, and he's on Twitter at Boo underscore Rad13. He says, hey, mate, when drafting in a real salary league, what do you regard as the best strategy? I've already mentioned that, Scott. I just wanted to get you out there because you are a big supporter of the show, and uh, you do tweet at me a lot, so I just wanted to get your name out there on the podcast. I've answered that question already. I think going for those cheap guys early gives you so much more flexibility. Guys, that will wrap it up for today. Good luck in the Red Rock Dynasty Leagues, the, the rookie drafts. The actual new Dynasty League start in about three or four days, the majority of them. Good luck in those ones. Subscribe to this podcast and give it a rating. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, and on Spotify. And of course, you can uh, find us on YouTube where you can go and hit that subscribe button, give a thumbs up, and leave a comment. Go check out the rest of the Locked On Podcast Network as well. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Donovan Mitchell.